Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 42. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank everyone who has liked, shared, and commented. Your support allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. And I also want to thank our sponsor, Cerberus Strength. Trusted since 2012, Cerberus is making the best strongman, powerlifting, and strength sports equipment and accessories, ensuring the ultimate competitive edge. Every one of their products is tried, tested, and proven by top-level athletes worldwide. So whether it's competing on the big stage at World's Strongest Man or training at home in the gym, server strength equipment is reliable, durable, and of course, strong enough to handle all your training goals and needs. So if you're in the market for the highest quality strength conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to check out serverstrength.com and use promo code STRENGTH underscore GAME to save on your next order. And in this week's episode, I am joined by Coach Dustin Daly. Daly is an assistant sports performance coach at Georgetown University, working with the football and men's lacrosse programs. Prior to his arrival at the Hilltop in 2021, he was the head speed and strength coach at D1 Sports Training in his home state of Texas. Additionally, he spent time as assistant coach at St. Leo University, professional performance center intern at the NSCA headquarters in Colorado Springs, and a graduate assistant at Salisbury University. Daly got a start as a personal trainer before internships at American University and as alma mater, the University of Maryland. Along with his current role, he is also a weightlifting coach, programming and coaching both recreational and competitive weightlifters. A former quarterback and wide receiver at the University of Maryland, Daly got into competitive weightlifting following his collegiate football career. He competes for Category 5 athletes weightlifting and has com- competed at the American Open Series in 2017, 2018, and 2019, as well as the 2018 University Nationals. I'm excited to have him on the show today. So with all that said, let's get in the game with Coach Dustin Daly. going on everybody today i am joined by a bury alumni and current iron hoya dustin daly what's going on man i'm doing great it's nice seeing you again it's been five six years <laughs> since the senior i know man it's been a while we worked together a little bit under foster at american mm-hmm. and i know between that time i've been i've been at fresno the whole time but you've been bouncing around a bunch so I want to yeah. I want to get into all that kind of into your current position, but first, kind of started off like how did you actually get involved in the strength game? Like, what sports did you play growing up, leading into competing competitively, like in weightlifting? All right, you growing up, um, growing up in Texas, football was king. So, uh, grew up playing football as a quarterback. Played a little bit of wide receiver, also. Um, also played basketball. Ran a little track. Uh, did more field than the track. Um, so I threw, so the training component kind of started there. Um, and we talked about this a little earlier before we started, but just, I had a really great strength and conditioning coach in college, uh, Drew Wilson and his staff with, uh, Justin and Alan, um, and kind of fell in love with the training component of it. And then got an opportunity to intern with uh, women's basketball with Katie Fowler at the university of Maryland. And it just went on from there. Um, I enjoyed the training component. I went into college wanting to be a physical therapist. Um, and I'll never forget the day of a uh, big D one school kinesiology class. Hey, who wants to be PT? My hand shoots up and I look around the room about 120 other hands went up. So I was like, okay, I might need to find something else to do for it. That's a little bit cooler. Uh, never thought about being a strength coach until it just kind of fell in my lap. So um, big believer of the you are where you are for a reason. Um, and you go through what you go through at the same time, because that's the, what opened my eyes to it was that one moment. So, um, then everything else fell into place. Now I got to where I'm at. <laughs> so nice. Yeah. I mean, those are some great mentors to kind of start up in the process, obviously playing football at Maryland, being able to be on the receiving end of their coaching and kind of see them in action. And then, I mean, I think a lot of people get into strength conditioning by just, 
happenstance. They like, they understand that they like training, but they don't really know that there's a full-time profession and there's so many different avenues you could take. And yeah, the physical therapy route, I mean, you skipped a lot of extra schooling for sure. So yeah, that's a, that's a good skipped benefit. A few, skipped a few years. Yeah. But now, I mean, you still, you still picked a saturated field at the moment. Maybe we'll see yeah. at this point. Hey, so you kind of touched on a little bit, really, you start, you got to start at your alma mater working at Maryland. Mm. And then, like I said, we worked together a little bit at American. We were both interning mm. there. Like what's actually got you to this current position. I mean, you just recently stepping into this assistant sports performance role at Georgetown. Mm. What kind of along the way did you learn in some of the other stops before you got here? Uh, I can probably do one everywhere. Um, American, uh, Sean Foster laid down the first real mentor that I had kind of sat down with me and Mario Pilato and laid out kind of training, like what it is. Um, before then, I never really had anyone sit down and really teach me and try to challenge me even from the standpoint of doing and being able to perform the lifts um, well from snatch, clean and jerk to squatting, et cetera. Um, so I kind of laid the foundation there. Then I went to Salisbury, um, the good, the good old Barry with Matt Nine, and, and he gives us GAs free reign. You do, you program what you want, and you just got to coach it and deliver. Um, he's one of those typical. As long as I'm not in a meeting about you, it's uh, free reign, and we get to develop those practical qualities of running what you want. You get to experiment a little bit. Um, then bounce, you know, finishing your master's degree at Salisbury, you need an internship. So I got the NSCA one um, in Colorado with uh, Caulfield and same, a little bit more of a taste of the private sector. Um, definitely not similar. They don't, it's not, a, you know, advertised as a private gym or anything like that. Um, but we did train some tactical. So I trained a lot of police, uh, emergency medical personnel, uh, some firemen, um, and there's some general population folks and got to kind of scale back my, <laughs> my, uh, training style. That's been mostly for our college athletics. Uh, so you got to kind of apply the same principles, but on a different scale, um, and interact with different people. That's what got me into the tactical realm of really respecting that, uh, population and what they do and the demands placed on them and also their uh, facilitators, whether they have them in a private sector, like the army's doing now with the holistic wellness approach. Um, then St. Leo university, Joe Nudo, um, different, a lot more, uh, restrictions in terms of the room and how we could use it. So no weightlifting for me during my time at St. Leo, my personal self, I still weightlifted, but for the teams, um, just room wasn't set up well for it. Too many people walking to and from on different cycles. We have two, three teams in at the same time. Um, a lot of people did not a lot of space and again, uh, Hey, you took away one of my major, um, tools, but I still had some in the bank. So I was able to, you know, work more with the squat, you know, more squat pulling, using it, squatting for speed, squatting for strength. Um, we can, you know, just adds an exercise kind of in my book. So I got to experiment with that. Um, uh, finally got to use like the Tendo extensively for a long period of time. Um, so I built up a little bit of everything in terms of practical application and a little bit of the X's and O's part. Um, and then COVID hit, boom, Here, here's the big kicker, right? Um, everybody kind of hit and it was real freaky how it hit. Um, everyone kind of didn't know what it was. So I just kind of had the means in my heart and kind of guy was telling me like, you gotta go home for a bit. So since I was 18, I went to Oregon. I don't know if you knew this about me uh, necessarily, but I, my first school was Lewis and Clark College in Oregon. So as an El Paso kid from Texas, I bounced to Oregon for a year, then went across the country to Maryland. Um, then as you draw this map, went to Colorado, went to Florida. So 10 years later, I kind of moved back to Texas just to be part of my family and closer, just if something crazy happened. Um, and I got to go into the private setting, which boy, oh boy, did you, <laughs> you want to add to the learning process. Um, I learned a lot of stuff there, um, especially just relationships and dealing with people that might not operate the way that you want. Um, trying to meet in the middle and make the best of what you got. But um, again, I think God put me there for a reason. I got to learn a lot and grew a lot of patience. And then come come knocking on the door a few months in was uh, Georgetown. Um, so that's how I got here. It's a long ride. <laughs> Sorry to take you through the last, what, six and a half years of my life. But 
No, that's cool. That's that, that's what I wanted to hear. And I, I know like bouncing around, obviously coaches, coaches that do it well, I mean, you're going to move a lot, but you're going to pick up a lot of stuff along the way. And it's, it's going to lead you to your next spot and it's going to give you some more tools that you have the ability to use and same way impact the athletes or impact the people that you have under your kind of supervision. I mean, like all that time you talked about a lot of different things that you were able to kind of learn along the process, but I mean, really you have to be super adaptable and super creative when you step into a lot of those different roles and early, like on in a career, you kind of really just take what's the best opportunity or the, or the next opportunity and take it for what it is and just kind of move on. You don't really get to make a lot of choices on like, this is where I want to be because you're, you're still kind of inexperienced at that time and you don't have such Mm -hmm. a big repertoire or resume to kind of bolster when you go to apply for jobs. But now like in your current position, like you've worked at, every division level and you've worked in the private sector, like the NSCA, like you said, like a lot of tactical athletes and stuff, like have there been a lot of differences in the type of people you're working or, or how have you been able to, from your previous stops, been able Mm -hmm. to like easily transition and, and kind of practically learn the type of demographic you're going to be working with so you can best utilize your tools. Um, in a, in a weird way, I kind of always depended on myself. Um, we talk a lot about it coming up, especially if we, we we're both tied to Matt and I and Sean Foster um, and just kind of being genuine, genuinely you. Uh, you don't want to, you know, don't want to fake how you are. Um, like I'm pretty, quote unquote, laid back for a quote unquote football strength coach. You know what I mean? So it's always like, this is who I am. I have high expectations, but I'm not going to necessarily change my delivery of, I like, I'm not going to change the information I'm going to give you. I may change how I deliver it. Um, but that's based on me trying to communicate, being a good communicator, but it doesn't necessarily change the actual information I'm giving you. So, um, really it's looking at, you know, looking at people's situations, gen, gen pop, you know, we're not looking to bolster up the squat. And in a weird way, right, we're not really looking at that with athletics either. Like, I don't care how much you squat. I'm trying to keep you healthy and keep you prepared to perform on your field. So in a way, they're related, but there's not going to be that cultural stigma of I have to be able to perform the squat extremely well. And that will translate over to my everyday life um, versus athlete squats well, therefore performance on the field is better, although it's not that cut and dry. Uh, so I, I think just the genuineness of your communication would be how I would divulge it because everyone's situations awkwardly the same. You know, we're, we're, our role doesn't change. We're trying to a protect you, you know, and b help you perform. So if we can do those two things, no matter your situation, the goal's kind of the same. Right. No, that's a good point. I mean, putting it all into perspective. I mean, like you said a lot of the demographic, it's just understanding the demands of the person you're working with, what their goals are. And you don't need to be sitting there number chasing and, and doing one rep maxes every week and stuff like that to actually (laughs) make an impact. Yeah, we know. Yeah. So it, it, it pays a lot to understand what the end goal is. And for Mm. in the college setting, it's making sure that they're prepared for the demands of their sport. They're injury free as much as possible. And, what you're doing in the weight room supplements what they're doing on the practice field so that they can perform. So that's, that's cool to hear because like, I mean, you didn't have a lot of experience in the tactical side or even in like the, the personal side, like the personal training side or the uh, general population. And that's something that you kind of have to just learn on the fly when you get in there, but Mm -hmm. being, being able to draw upon like all the different coaching experiences you have that, that helps a ton. You kind of talked about it like when you were at St. Leo, like smaller division two school and not having like the access, the facility to do mm-hmm. what you kind of enjoy doing, enjoy coaching is a lot of weightlifting movements and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's a tool. So when you're kind of actually going into, it's kind of a two part question when you're going into adding or like thinking about adding weightlifting movements into a program, like how much does the facility or even the athletes play a part in you wanting to implement that into the program and what kind of 
besides maybe like the small side of like the St. Louis facility, what are some other things that just like make it a no go to add into a program? Um, I'd say immediately some, most of it's the equipment. So like you don't have bumper plates and uh, weightlifting barbells in terms of they have, um, they can spin you're restricted and you don't want to turn a clean over and, you know, have your wrist go just so you can say you cl you're cleaning. Um, and you'll probably hear this from a lot of people who have uh, female athletes of having 15 kilo barbells really plays a role. It allows the smaller hand to exhibit more control of the barbell. So um, that, that does play a role for sure. The athlete, I think it really carries over to how much time you're willing to put into it. Um, the way that, the training works in terms of how I was brought up was everything layers on top of each other. Um, we, we talk about teaching it top down all the time in the field. Like, Hey, we're going to teach you the front rack and then we're going to teach you position one or your power position. And we're going to teach you go, to go down to the floor, but like you can still train during that teaching component. You don't have to per se, um, you don't have to per se clean from the floor that day or that phase, you can position one in RDO and front squat for a year, two years, and still provide very good training. It's just how much time are you willing to stay in that realm? I think you have to make an educated decision on the level of athletes, but um, I have to steal it from Foster now because he said it, and I like the way it sounds like, don't, don't give a permission structure just to do easy things. I'm like, hey, cleaning's hard but it also provides you a little bit of a mental stimulus that I personally feel you don't get from other stuff. Um, even like squatting heavy is a mint, like that's a mentality that you need to have. But if you can approach a front squat or a RDL or a light clean with the same type of mentality for that, you know, awe inspiring one rep max Instagram shot that you're looking for, you know, what are you willing to do in terms of athletics what else are you not doing or wanting to avoid? You have a preference to do easy things, but when the going gets tough, what situation do you find yourself in? Um, so I, I think the equipment and facility more than the athlete in terms of as they are ready to handle the next phase, I think you can do whatever you'd like. Um, but I, the only time I would say if, if they have a structural issue, if you got a broken wrist, like I'm probably not going to clean you especially if you're a quarterback and you're throwing a rock a lot. I'd rather not get, risk it. I may have you do something else. Um, but I think that's more situational versus a uh, general question, kind of like what you're asking. Right. No, that's a great point. I like that. I mean, obviously, we both learned a lot of weightlifting variations and kind of the progression and stuff from Coach Foster and mm -hmm. understanding those things. I do like saying that, like, it layers on it and – it's not really like a block approach where you have to do this for a certain amount of weeks to be able to progress mm. to something else. Like it, it all builds on each other and you should be able to kind of layer those things together. And I know like, like obviously it's a very complex movement being able to snatch jerk and, and clean. So there are different components that need to be added and layered together to get to the ultimate one. And if that's your goal, that's fine. But I mean, you can still do weightlifting movements as a derivative or just a variation of it and, and still be able to accomplish a ton of stuff. But like, yeah. I like what you talked about the mental, the mental thing, like actually choosing something difficult because mm -hmm. there's a difference. Yeah. There's a lot, there's a technical component to it. And there is, there is a mental approach to like a heavy squat or a heavy deadlift and being able to set up and do stuff right. But there is a skill and there's a technique and there's, there's a specific like way that you have to manipulate your body and prepare for a heavier clean or even just a clean in general, if it's something new you're learning. So it is something difficult and you do have to kind of weigh the timing of how often you're going to see these athletes and stuff mm -hmm. like that before you actually implement in the program. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I even add like, um, really kind of two examples like nice thing about college athletics is their goal isn't a weightlifting team i'm not trying to put numbers on your clean and jerk and your snatch so you have a higher total I'm trying to use them as a tool in order to use mental and physical adaptation so um we we had this discussion kind of for fun among the staff like you know are you planning on snatching football again? you know i'm like well, maybe 
but I want to make sure the three or four days I have with them are on the clean. Cause we're going to do that more. So that carries over a bit more. So then if I have you snatch once a week, let's say three day split, right. And you go clean and jerk Monday, Friday, and I'm snatching Wednesday. You look at that on this grand scale over the course of 10 weeks, you have 10, 10 sessions of snatch, you know, like how much does that weigh in truly in that 10 weeks of 10 sessions? And you're talking three to five sets a day um, is that's not enough repetition, you know, so I'd rather use it as a day of reinforcing the cleans so all of a sudden, you know, build the clean first. And as you well know, qualities carry over position one is still position one. Um, you know, it's easier to carry it over as you slowly integrate doing both. Um, I think sometimes I mind myself when I was younger and just starting, you try to dive into both immediately and you'll always see the one that you're doing the least amount through the week kind of fall off. Um, they do carry over, but just, it's not the same. So I think to your point, you know, look at the grand scale. Hey, I got 12 weeks with them. Is that 12 sessions versus 24? You know, I'd rather take the 36 of the clean <laughs> because they're going to clean well and with 36 sessions in 12 weeks. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, I think I fall victim to that when I first started too. was I think that the more I thought that the more that you put exercise into a program, the more well-rounded you were going to be. And mm -hmm. if like in the position I was in, like having more training experience than the athletes I was working with that, oh yeah, well, this is very, this exercise is very similar to this other exercise. So they'll pick it up just as easily, mm -hmm. but that's not always the case. And I think it looks a lot better. Like, like you said, 12 weeks on a three day split, that's 36 clean sessions you could do. Now in the next, the next training phase, we slowly introduce the snatch a little bit. Mm -hmm. They have 36 like quality sessions to kind of revert revert back to and now it starts to click rather than trying to really major in two things at the same time just put your focus mm -hmm. in on what's really important and what's really important you're going to do daily all the time mm -hmm. that, that's that's the biggest thing so one thing i wanted to talk to you about because like facility aside obviously like georgetown's new facility is is pretty legit so mm -hmm that that's that doesn't come into question when you have to program like weightlifting mm -hmm. but one of the big things that you also have to focus on is like just the teaching aspect of it and having quality people around based off the size of your team and two mm -hmm. of your two of the, the programs that you work with are much larger teams like over 100 yeah. football guys over 50 men's lacrosse players so how do you mm -hmm. kind of practically go about teaching these things in like a larger group like, is there, is there a certain approach that you have to change or even is there a tweak in the progression that you can do with one of these bigger teams versus either one-on-one -on -one or maybe like mm. a smaller program like volleyball when you have like 10 or 15 at a time? Mm. I would say um, practically for here, we have a really good staff. Um, we go over the lifts. Um, we're, we're honestly starting like a mini weightlifting crew. So um, it's some people who are very educated, very good at coaching and open to learning more about it and how to coach it. So being able to station them um, helps a lot, especially in the way the facility is set up. So I don't know if you've heard about Georgetown yet, but you can't see through any of these racks. They're kind of back to back. So you need to have sections um, with big teams, especially. Uh, but I'd say try to control things on the cadence. Um, yeah, this would sound very familiar to you, but just so I can try to explain it very shortly of defining positions, like use the phase beforehand to define your position. So you don't have to do position one cleans at all. You can do position one, start an RDL and train. So you have a defined position one and then you'll front squat and you have a defined front rack. And then when you start doing the clean, you, when you say position one after four weeks, you should get everyone around the same position one. And then you say jump catch, whatever cue you want to use, and they turn it over into their front rack for their front squat. It's so a little bit more natural because they have four weeks of focusing on just the two things. Um, so I'd say if you can draw it back of saying, hey, we're going to take the time to define positions first. So you know start, you know end, and then I'll cadence you. You know, position one, jump, catch, good, reset, 
whatever cadence you want to use, I think that'll slow things down and let them take it rep by rep. It also controls the weight that they can do. I loved watching week one of doing position one cleans on cadence. All these dudes asking if they can drop the bar in between. It was like, no, it's just three reps. Like, come on. You shouldn't be having to regrip 135, bud. Like, big bad football guy like you, like, grip that thing. If it's, it's just too heavy, man, just go down. Um, then as you transition, like, position two below the knee, um, one thing I used, uh, and I only mentioned it just because the main people who assist me kind of never seen it before is I break my reps up now just as a way of letting the move the room flow a bit more because if we spend too much time on cadence it will, with what the situation and training we have now takes up a good chunk of the time so instead of going cadence for three reps I'm saying you're going to break it up yourself we know what the position two is so you're going to go position one to position two back to position one pause jump catch that's rep one Rep two, you're going down to position two and you're going to do a slow, like a slow to fast. You're going to slowly bring it up to P1 and you're going to roll into it and take your second rep. Then your third rep, go to P2 and you're going. But you're trying to reinforce that bar path and the positioning. And it's a little bit more natural where they're slowing it down themselves because you've created that. It's just not on a hard cadence. Um, So it does speed up by about eight to nine minutes for me is what I kind of counted. Uh, in terms of still getting technical work and being able to dive into coaching the individuals that needed a little bit more. Yeah, that's a good um, point. I mean, the, the cadence stuff, yeah, it does take a lot, a lot of time. Mm. And I think it's super helpful though, in the beginning, because you get everybody mm-hmm. to work together. The only hard part is, and I know I've seen that a lot of times working by myself with some teams or, or having some like an intern or someone assisting that's that can't either can't catch everything or is still kind of learning how I want things run is like you're coaching the cadence as hard as possible. It takes a lot of time, but you also Mm. can't coach the person up. So that that's a good point to like start with a hard cadence, get everybody to understand the start, like the position, start position, the finish position and what Mm. is like a defined good and good rep. And then from there, start to leave it like into the player's hands where you can actually go around and address some of those people with like their individual issues and stuff like that. So that's a good point. It's a good way to like actually practically go about teaching it. Mm. Hey, so we kind of talked about like the, the mental approach for Mm. like weightlifting and even like heavy squats and stuff. Like there is an intangible that comes to that and there's a huge benefit for it. Like, yourself you do a lot of weightlifting you've been Mm -hmm. training you've been competing in as well have you seen a benefit to your coaching or even like the mental like your mental approach to coaching from your own experience getting on the platform and training every day uh i definitely would say and i think it's a combination of things um like I'm, I'm a Christian guy. I, I do a lot of stuff kind of faith oriented in terms of how I draw things to and from. So, you know, being on the platform for anyone who's never <laughs> my second meet ever was a American Open Series just to paint the picture. And Piros Demas is my center judge. So, you know, like having arguably one of the best weightlifters in the world ever sitting in front of you on your second meet ever puts a certain pressure on you especially when you're on an elevated stage with the spotlight on you I've never experienced that so like coming from a team sport you kind of end up like you get to hide I play quarterback I still you still get to hide a little bit and the team identity of things so going into a place where you're by yourself and it's just you and an inanimate object that you have to move um, I think really opened up to this kind of like wow it, it the 12 weeks leading to this moment did matter Um, And then you start to, as a coach, as we program, you know, we look at things in phases and seasons, um, much like we do in life. You have a good season, a bad season based on things that are happening. And you're like, wow, these 12 weeks before this moment really did mean something. Um, You have a bad moment happen in your life. Like you, you, you don't know it at the time, but when you reflect, you're like, wow, I went through that for this moment. Like those six months, my life sucked but I went through that so I can handle this better. So I think weightlifting highlighted that for me. It's like uh, practically, yeah, this, these 12 weeks of training, I didn't sleep much. I was up at six. I stayed and coached late till six. Um, I only had 40 minutes to train and it showed, but then you get to the point 
of like, Hey guys, I've been there practically. This training does matter. You may not see it, but it does matter. Also life, you know, life talk, real talk. Hey, these things do matter. How you handle yourself and how you come in every day to the facility, how you go to practice. We talk the mentality thing. Like it does matter. You come into a hard squat you can have the idea of, you know, I mean, you probably have it. We have a few heavy squatting days yourself. We have bad days. You're like not looking forward to it. You have good days. You want the difficulty because you know, you can handle it. Um, and I think that mindset of learning how to navigate that um, kind of teeter totter of good days and bad days with training does help when it comes to athletics and then past life coaching wise, it's, made me more comfortable like hey every day is important every rep is important if I can coach you on this rep I should because if I let it go that means I you let it go and if you don't know about it we got one rep worse then some people argue that doesn't really matter like oh man you you never really know you are you are what you um you know you are what you let go I guess I can't think of the, my favorite saying but you are what you tolerate I guess is what I'm trying to say no, that's that I would completely agree with that, too. I mean, when you look at like what we actually put on a program and there's a defined reps for the most times, like, all right, I'm doing five sets of three for for cleans today. If you do one one bad set, that's 20 percent of your mm -hmm. whole training session that day is poor, like an 80 percent might look good. But that if you take that 80 percent into a game that could be a turnover that mm. loses the game. So I get, I get how some people would argue that like, you can't be perfect on every single rep. We're not looking for perfection. We're just looking for progress. And mm. we're really trying to define consistency and for you to like pay attention to those details and always be attentive to what you're doing because one rep really does matter. And mm. Like it might not matter in the grand scheme of things, but if we start letting one thing slide, then we'll, the next rep's going to slide. It's going to affect the third rep. It's going to affect the next set. So you're trying to build some good equity on your part to make sure that what you're doing is positive and it's actually beneficial because I, I don't, I don't believe like what well, you can say what you want. I don't believe in maintenance, like strength during the season. It's like, we're either getting better or worse. Like nothing ever stays the same. And you can mm. call it maintenance all you want, but at the end of the day, like if we just drop off the map, we're getting worse. So you have mm. to, you have to continually try to get better and you have to really emphasize whether it be a single rep, a single set, a single session. But I think the biggest thing that you kind of like alluded to is you just have to go in there and do it. Like if it's mm. not, a, if it's not a great day, reevaluate and come back. I mean, you, I don't think you would have like felt the same way if you hadn't gone through that experience, like at the American open and like been under mm. those lights. So that's huge. Have you seen, have you been able to like, I mean, obviously we talked about it. The players are not going to be under those bright lights individually. And you can, mm. you said yourself, like even as a quarterback, you can hide under that team identity. Have mm. you found any ways to, maybe not like doing test sets or anything like that, but that might be one way. Have you found any ways to kind of highlight or really put an individual player like on that, like quote unquote platform themselves so they can feel mm. individually they're doing what's right and they can't just hide within the team. Mm. Um, I have a thing. It's more of a fun thing, but it's part of um, coming in with, you know, after this COVID thing and these guys have had very inconsistent training and we have a lot of turnover of just coming in and it's like, we'll point guys out in the session and be like, <laughs> you coach me to the team. And you have to display, you have an understanding of what's going on. And it's not, you know, we, you know, well, Hey, the kicker, like yeah, everyone will just do stereotype and kicker doesn't need to lift like, no kicker come here and display that you have an understanding of what we're trying to accomplish so then your team knows that you understand what's going on and then i'll highlight you when you're able to technically perform what we're looking for um so you're going to have some very gifted athletes who are strong i mean we we got guys position one and 285 you're just strong athlete 
but that, that doesn't necessarily mean he, he because he's strong he can hide a lot of the stuff so having a a kicker in terms of this in this uh, scenario walking up and saying hey to myself not directly to the player like your position one's wrong because you're allowing the bar to slide down your thigh you're not in a true position while you're cheating it and it's like i didn't say that he did you know what i mean that's because we reinforce it so much but like if the more you can get them to talk to each other and uphold the standard of movement i think you're going to have them kind of on that platform and when they get here they don't know it yet but when they do get here it's like when we do quote unquote test sets which like test sets for me are coaches are watching you and signing off whether you're <laughs> whether you're technically competent i don't really care about the weight on the bar i need to know that you're moving through the range of motion we want you're moving with the technique that we want and the weight will come naturally is we'll stop and have guys come watch say like hey we're gonna watch this and this is this is so-and-so's test set he may not have the biggest numbers but you're on that platform of the room has stopped to watch you um and i think everyone's going to have moments like that at least they feel like they have moments like that in their life at some point but um, for the fun fact that we use the kicker as an example, like, hey, man, down, down, down one, field goal from 37-yard field goal, that's probably the roughest spot in football I've ever seen. I could imagine being a kicker at a, uh, at a power five school. Down, down two, two seconds left on the 37. Yeah, make it you in. <laughs> or not. So. Or, or not, not you, you're the hero or the villain. <laughs> yeah, you're not going through campus without hearing some jeers the rest of the time. That's yeah, it's a hard position to be in, but no, that's a good approach. That's I think that's a great way to like start to kind of put players on their own like little island. I mean, mm. I, I think I learned that a lot from like my wrestlers having them involved in an individual sport, but it still gets judged a lot of times mm. whether or not you win or lose off the team. So there's a, there's components to it. And I think football and a lot of other sports are the same way. You have certain matchups, you have a certain responsibility that you're supposed to do like that, how you approach that and how your performances dictates how the team actually, what the result's going to be. So if you can mimic that in the weight room and do stuff, like you said, I, I think that's huge, but making sure that not, test sets are just not about the number of reps or what the weight on the bar is and making sure that like technically they're proficient and how they move. I think that's, that's more because then you emphasize how they do it more so than like what they're doing or the amount that's on the bar. I think that's, that's important. And, and them being able to like reiterate and understand what you're actually teaching them. I think that, creates a better understanding and they become more competent in it because now you just created a hundred coaches. Like they're mm -hmm. able to kind of correct each other. And now they feel comfortable probably to call each other out, which is, which mm -hmm. is only going to help the team. If they yep. see a guy cheating something, things along those lines. Uh, that's, I, I love the weight room for that regard. And I think that's yeah. huge. And sometimes you can't really do it on the field because everybody's thinking, Oh, well, this is QB one, like QB four can't say mm. shit to me. Like, yeah, you're not good. Like it, you don't, when you get into the weight room, you can't really carry the same. You can't have the same like rank as you do mm. on the field. You can't just go in there and say, well, I'm, I'm the number one center. So what I says goes, it was like, mm. well, you're really not good in the weight room. It doesn't, nothing matters in here. Like mm. how, where you rank on the field, like your performance numbers, like what you're an all American. I don't care. Like everybody is equal when it comes to the weight room and how we train. That's awesome. Yep. And you can link that back to that question of like working in a big group. If you take your time and teach hard, you make, everyone's got a, everyone's got a coach. If you're partnered up, you got a teammate watching you who, if they understand the simple things start and finish, they can give you enough. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's one of the goals we talked about as a team. I was like, my goal is for all of you to understand what we're doing to where I, I joked, like, if I got shot, I didn't make it into work for whatever reason. And like, y'all, the lift has to go on. Y'all know what to do. And you understand why we're doing it. Um, and I think they've displayed really good stuff from that point 
um, just here at Georgetown. Shout out to the, the guys for a little mini shout out for them. No, that's, that's a great point. I'd, I'd like to think, I mean, my goal is to coach them as hard as possible. I like, I love spring sports or like mm-hmm. sports you're allowed to have a real true development season and preseason because mm-hmm. Like I, I blow my load just trying to fucking coach the hell out of them in the beginning. So then we get the season, I can kind of sit back and there's so much stress and there's so many things going on with them just trying to focus on performance. Like, I don't want to be teaching them a lot of things or be like sitting there pointing out all these small details when I could have gone that over that in the 16 weeks that I had in the preseason and the developmental season. That's, that's when you coach them as hard as possible. So then when they get through, all you're doing is gentle reminders, changing things here, there, giving them a little autonomy, like, all right, recovery day has got to switch to this day, stuff like that, where you're just tinkering with things, but you, you got through the meat and potatoes of everything that needed to be accomplished in that off season. And you really like drove a culture home that is willing to work. And now get to do what they came to school to do and play their sport. Mm-hmm. Hey, so Thanks. why, why did you uh, like coming back from Maryland and like you started getting into coaching, what made mm-hmm. you really want to like continue to train and continue to compete? Like what drew you to weightlifting actually? <laughs> uh, Sean Foster, 100%. He, so I'm, I'm one of those people that hold on to things people say, I don't necessarily let you know that it doesn't impact me to that level. I've joked with him about this before, but he was like, he's like, yeah, like you're not a real weightlifter until you've competed. And then he said something, I don't remember the exact day, but he was like, yeah, you'll never be good. And it bothered me. So I'm, I'm on this like very, very, uh, <laughs> very vengeful quest to be considered a good weightlifter at some point, which by the way, is not going well when you really, especially the Olympics going on, I'm constantly reminded how inadequate of a lifter I am. But um, it's, it's been fun on a real note. It's fun because it's, again, mentally challenging. Um, I've heard people say it's the golf of, you know, it's the golf of uh, fitness, you know, and, and it's mentally challenging. You have to lock in mentally. It gives me a place to escape to um, in terms of um, even for young coaches, be careful where you escape to. Uh, can't always be the weight room. But um you know, it lets me kind of draw my mind back onto one singular goal for a very short amount of time. And it allows me to kind of lock in and truly see the meaningfulness of a small pull from the ground and scooping, you know, scooping the bar, being in position, being patient and all these things I start equating to life where this is very much therapeutic for me. Don't get me wrong, it's stress, it's weightlifting, it's very stressful, but it's therapeutic for me in terms of drawing back and recentering myself to one singular goal for the day or even for the set. Um, and it gives me enough to kind of refuel my mindset when it comes to any rough day that I've had. Um, if it's a good day, I usually lift well. If it's a bad day, I try to turn it into a good day. Like, hey, recenter, refocus, it's just a day. Um, goal was accomplished, you know, felt rough, but goal was accomplished. Now let's do it now. One rep at a time, have a good day. Boom. Reset for tomorrow. Um, so that's kind of what's challenged me in terms of keeping up competing. So, uh, next competition, TBD it's coming, it's coming soon. Now that I'm, uh, in an area for sure. And, uh, competitions are starting to open up. So there you go. Well, I look forward to you getting back on the platform. It's always, it's always good to, to get back under the lights a little bit and kind of showcase all the training. That's a, that was always one of the one things that I I've told interns and everything is like, just pick something and and try it at least once. Cause most people come in as like interns or they want to get involved in like the coaching profession. I was like, you don't have to be great at everything. You don't have to be like a professional in whatever strength sport you pick, but most, most people come in and don't have, anything but a team sport background. So Mm. like kind of all the things that we talked about on the individual side and being able to set goals for yourself, find something that like is therapeutic where you can train and recenter yourself, but then also find something, just challenge yourself once and, Mm -hmm. and, and step on the platform, pick a strength sport or pick something individual and, and, and just kind of progress at it and then see what happens. Cause you're, you'll find something out. You might maybe never do it again, 
but you'll find yeah. something out about yourself and it'll definitely impact how you coach and how you program. Mm-hmm. And that, that could be anything. I know what like we're very much promoting the strength sports, but you could, I mean, you could do, you could be, I know, what's my stuff. Some of my mom does. You can cross stitch for all I care. You know what I mean? But if you like, think about cross stitching. Like if you really think about how, how diligent and, and patient you have to be to just go one stitch at a time. I remember my mom used to read them. She'd yeah, this is, she'd be excited. Hey, Hey babe, this, this, a, a 50,000 stitch, uh, lion I'm gonna make for you. And I'm like 50,000 stitch. How many stitches do you do? And she'll show me. And it was like 18 seconds to do one stitch. I'm like, you got 50,000 of those. Like, wow. The fact that you sit here and you find enjoyment of threading a needle through cloth, that's going to take that long. And you, I mean, it bothers me when I watch you do it. That's like, man, that's, that's so much work. And in a way it's the same as weightlifting. You don't get to see the end product until you put all the work in. And it's like, we talk about layering. That's like the whole thing of my life is like, that's the whole, that's faith. That's the definition of faith. I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but you have to go every day with it. If you can find one thing, powerlifting, strongman, CrossFit, weightlifting, uh, they got any cool things, new strength sports I don't know about. Uh, <laughs> you know, you go, go, go do, go do, um, go do a 5k. If you really about that life, I know I'm not, but, you know, <laughs> go go do something that you got to train for, practice, and then go look at the finished product, see what it is. No, you're, gonna, you're gonna fall in love with something. Oh, no doubt. I love that though. Like you said, the product comes from the process, really, and it's it's easily easy to be discouraged, and and people get really excited about what the end result looks like, and and want to be a part of like a national championship team or or want that really nice lion stitch finish. Like Mm -hmm. they don't realize all the work that goes into it, like all the hours, like all the dedication and like discipline that goes into the work and the process Mm -hmm. of actually getting to that end result. But the payoff is so much better when you know that you put in the time, you know, you put in the effort and then the results come like they might not be exactly what you want, but more people are satisfied with that when you have put in all the time and effort and energy to get to that point. And then you put it all on the line where you have a product to show for it. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. it's like, that's craftsmanship. And I mean, that that's, that's weightlifting. Like you said, that's faith for yourself too. Like there, there's a lot of things that go into that and it's, it's a day in day out process. That's awesome to hear, man. Mm -hmm. Hey, so how do you kind of go about, like uh, improving and kind of sharpening your sword so that you can kind of get better. Obviously you're surrounded by a lot of coaches there that are very successful and and helpful on the side, but are there any kind of go-to recommendations for like websites or people or coaches that you kind of lean on outside of Georgetown? Um, I could say, I could say a few things. I I'd say more of, I'll go more of the mindset route since that's kind of been one of the staples of our conversation is like, don't be afraid to ask questions and also don't be afraid to truly pay attention and to unlock your mind to a different way of doing things. Um, so we, for example, FRC has been going around. I've never been certified in it, but I, it caught my eye just from being on Instagram, not a certain person, just someone happened to share, but I was keeping a watchful eye out for, Hey, this looks interesting. And you click on it, you dive into it. Then you start asking people questions. You, you go down that, that, that rabbit hole. Like, who do I know that does this? All right. I don't know anybody who is the guy or the lady that I need to contact to start learning about this. I need to look up. And then you go down that rabbit hole and that's how you network too. You end up reaching out to people just because you simply want to know and better yourself. Um, so I, I would say, go, don't be afraid to go down that rabbit hole, you know, keep an open mind. Um, and you'll be surprised with what you'll learn and who you'll meet. And you never know the role that that'll play in your next job or looking for a next job or the next session that you're programming. And you're like, Hey, this actually has a place in my program. And I'm very happy that two years ago I contacted so-and-so about this thing. And I learned it at this day. And then I met him in a conference a year later and we talked about it in depth. Like, I think that's the, I think that's the, uncom- I think that's the most common, l- the most common and least talk about way of learning things. 
Um, everyone likes to say like this person, like we all probably look at the same people, like honestly in the field of who to go to for certain things. Like we all know, um, we all know the Carl Dietz, you know, we, we all know these names and um, Cal Strength for weightlifting. Like we know Everett for weightlifting. We know the names, but don't be afraid to find someone who you actually are interested in to try and learn from. Um, so that'd be my big thing for anyone coming up. That's how I'd learn. I just find something and I start asking questions. I like that. I mean, I think you said, you said something that I know Foster says all the time too. Like if you're interested in something, go to the source and yeah. go to the, go to the person that you actually, that knows the information the best. And then I think at the same, in the same breath, like what you said as well, go to the person that like you think practically does it best too, because I mean, you could read triphasic to your blue in the face, but it, it works best for Cal. I mean, there's mm. there you got 15 interns for mm. a 15, 15 hockey players. And at the same time that are all NHL qual quality players that are probably mm. going to get drafted and you have unlimited resources at that point in time. Like practically I can't do tripasic the same way as him. So mm. if you want to do FRC and, and you want to do it for a football team, it's probably best to talk to someone that does it really well with a football team rather mm. than someone that does it one-on-one. -on -one. So I think, yep. I think going to both resources is great. Going to the person that knows it the best, but also talking to people mm. that practically apply it as well. Mm. Awesome, man. Hey, well, we, we end the show like any good training session. We got a, a finisher for you. So we got four quarters, four questions, and 37 yards out. Two oh, there we go. There we go. We got overtime, <laughs> and you're going to be the kicker, or you can be the quarterback for the. You'll be the quarterback. I'll be the holder. Time. I'll be the holder. <laughs> oh, man. I think that might be just as stressful, too. Oh, yeah. I've done that before. <laughs> Trust me, it's stressful for sure. Damn. All right. Race well. is out, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, so take as much time as you want, or you can go rapid fire with them, but you ready? Let's do it. All right. First one I got for you, biggest influence in strength and conditioning and biggest influence in weightlifting. Uh, I'll say strength and conditioning, Drew Wilson, guy who planted the seed, and Sean Foster, the guy who planted the seed. I got to give it out to, to them for the seed planting. Yet to grow. Okay. Hey, what about... I'll, I'll give you this since the Olympics are on too. And then if they didn't make the Olympics, that's fine too. But favorite, favorite weightlifting athlete. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I'll, I'll, I, I don't, I hate to go anyone non team USA with the Olympics going on, but all the team USA shout out to you, but I really enjoy watching Jonathan Rebus. He's a Colombian. He's one of my favorite lifters to watch. All right. What can you be found doing when you're not coaching or competing? What are some of your hobbies outside of the weight room? <laughs> All right. Shocker to the world. I'm a huge video gamer. Uh, <laughs> so um, moving around so much, most of my friends are all over the country. So it's the one place that on weeknights, weekends, you know, we can set a time and I'm playing with someone in Colorado, someone in Texas, someone in Florida, someone around Maryland. So that's more of a social time for me, but you know, if you practice anything, you get a little good at it. So uh, that is probably the main hobby. You'll catch me. You'll catch me on the sticks as they say, uh, I like it. all the young guys say. I like it. Hey, so if you weren't coaching in strength conditioning, what do you think you would be doing as a profession? And Ooh. maybe if you never met Foster, what strength sport do you think you would got into? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, truly, it's kind of it's kind of terrifying to think about not being a strength coach after all this stuff you've done. And um, I think I'd still be a coach. Um, I've said this before to some of uh, my closer friends when we talk life and stuff. Like, you don't have to have the title to be a coach. Still, no, you you that's a mindset of wanting to better the people around you. So. Um, I, I could do anything and I'd still want to coach people and help people get from A to B. Um, I think that's just the educator in me. So I'll go ahead and say, I'll, I'll, I'll do the easy cop out. I'll probably be a teacher. Um, just cause that's been in the family for years. That was what my great grandmothers did. You know, my father was a teacher too. It's just kind of a real easy, practical uh, transition 
going from coaching to teaching because teachers are coaches and coaches are teachers there. I just cheated your question. Um, All right. Oh man. And you said, what strength sport do I think I would have gotten into if I never met Sean Foster? Uh, Dude, I probably would have been a CrossFitter at some point. I probably would have been like, dude, I can't do a handstand nor walk on my hands. That seems pretty cool. Someone teach me how to do it. I'd probably be broke though. CrossFit, (laughs) CrossFit boxes and coaching cost a lot. So um, yeah. I'd probably be a CrossFitter. Still snatch and clean and jerk, though, so. I know. That's what I was saying. You cheated two questions in a row. Dang. Did, see? I did <laughs> like that. All right. Hey, if you're setting up an ideal training session, what's your training music or PR song? And then what's your go-to best post-training meal? Uh, just me personally? Yeah. Man, you you got to do In the Air Tonight. And you wait until the drums hit to take, to touch the bar. You let it play the whole, about what is it? Like two and a half minutes, two minutes, 40 seconds. And then right when the drums start, you approach the bar and you take your set. That would be my very, very favorite way of taking a PR attempt. Uh, Post meal. Mm. It has got to be, it's going to be a little, little old school, but if you go steak, sweet potatoes, and in it, oh man, I'd do asparagus. That'd be my main meal. I'd do steak, asparagus, and a sweet, sweet baked potato. All right, all right. And, all right. and a little bit of Dr. Pepper because I'm from Texas. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Last one for you. Overtime right. here. This game's on the line. Most OT, valuable piece of coaching advice you've received. And if you want to share from who? Oh, this has been really from everyone. Um, everyone says a version of this, but I'll say it. I'll say it how my, I'll say how my dad says it. He says, just, he says, just do you. Um, you, you get brought up and you get taught certain things growing up. Um, and fun fact, my parents, fun fact, young coaches, my parents are not fans of me being a strength coach when they found out the, the uh, legitimacy of the life that we live. Um, but that all changed when they actually got to watch me do a uh, weightlifting camp for a CrossFit gym. So they got to see me coach for two days live. And I think them seeing me be the person that they raised me to be. And they're like, wow, he's 100% serious. I've never seen the last time I saw this was football. You know what I mean? Like I was 100% myself doing me because when I am myself and I'm truly invested in it, the best version of yourself is going to come out. So I think just do you, do you and be you by Monty Daly would be, uh, would be the, my best coaching advice. Um, stay in your realm as my other favorite one. He says, stay in your realm or stay in your lane. My bad. It's my other favorite one. He tells me all the time. Awesome, man. I like that. I mean, I think being a genuine coach and being yourself, that's, that's the only way you're going to stay in this profession and, I mean, it's good to see that you found something that you're really drawn to and you're able to be yourself in it. So that's good. That's awesome. Hey, so where can, uh, where can people actually get a hold of you if, you've, if they've got any questions, follow along? You got a Twitch stream too if you're playing games? <laughs> Twitch, Twitch is coming up. My, my buddy's been trying to talk me into streaming. I don't know. Maybe that'll be a second revenue uh, generator for me. Um, but I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's uh, Dustin died every day. That's a play on my name. Yes, I know. Um, and then if anyone wants to reach out, they can uh, contact me on there or even my email for Georgetown, um, which is DD1078. Don't ask me what the numbers mean. I don't know. Uh, but at Georgetown.edu. Um, and that's really it. When I get the Twitch stream, don't worry. I'll let everybody know. The world will know when I start to Twitch. So I know that'd be pretty cool. I mean, especially if it's a bunch of strength coaches on there all at the same time. That's, that's the best part is that it's about five strength coaches playing uh, playing Call of Duty at the same time. So you can imagine where our conversations go. Oh, man, that's probably wild. Hey, I know I know you're pretty busy in camp getting ready for getting mm-hmm. ready for the season. So I appreciate you coming on today, man. It was great to catch up. I can't not have a Salisbury and Georgetown alumni on. So I appreciate you coming on today, man. Agreed. Appreciate you for having me. We got to do it more often, not wait five years in a pandemic to do it. Oh, no doubt. I'll have to get, uh, I'll have to get logged on so we can actually play some games then. 
there we go. Hey, well, one <laughs> safe, safe, safe move, man. Uh, been doing a lot of traveling. So um, I hope you uh, enjoy the change and the move and you get there safe, man. I appreciate that, man. Well, we'll keep in touch. And uh, thanks again, dude. I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. See ya. See ya. That's it for this episode of The Strength Game. Thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors, Cerberus Strength. Be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below. Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachO'Brien.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.